Um, it is a huge pleasure to be able to announce our chef here in a moment. I'm going to take about five minutes and give a, a quick background that's not going to do chef uh, justice on the amazing attributes that he's had over the past years. Um, I'm Scott Jean Bastiani. I'm with the food team, the Google Food Program, and it's my pleasure to announce uh, chef here. A quick bio um, uh, on his background and then we'll get into the demonstration. Uh, and then after the demonstration, uh, questions I believe are going to be kind of fielded throughout the demo. Uh, you would appreciate uh, kind of that interaction from you guys. And then after the demonstration, there will be some sampling of two of the dishes, which I'll talk about. And then right at 1230 uh, or 1235, since you started late, uh, Chef will go into a book signing. So I know everyone has their books there. And thank you for coming on time, if not early. So with that, um, James Siaboot, our guest here today, was born in Northeast Thailand before his family immigrated to Oakland in 1981 amongst a community of refugees after the conclusion of the Vietnam War, growing up watching his mother cook in Thai restaurants. After graduating from the California Culinary Academy, a fellow alumni, thank you, <laughs> Chef, back in 99, uh, James left to hone his craft aboard, working in some of the most reputable kitchens I'm sure you've heard of, including the Fat Duck in the UK, uh, then under Dan Patterson at Koi in San Francisco, as well as the season at El Bulli in Spain, so some really top-end restaurants. Then in 2009, James opened his first restaurant in Oakland called Comi, which holds two Michelin stars. He then opened uh, Hawker Fair in Oakland, which is now closed, and then reopened in San Francisco in 2015. He's also the uh, co-owner of uh, Old Can Beer Company. Anyone there yet, been there yet? I have to check that out. Beer Garden, super cool. Mm -hmm. He's the founder of Hawking Bird, both of which are in Oakland. His book today, which everyone has, Hawker Fair, uh, was created uh, to uh, honor his heritage and immigrant parents. Uh, his parents born from two distinct Asian cultures, his mother, ancestral village, uh, village in Isan, Thailand, and his father in uh, Pakse, Laos. His family arrived in Oakland in 81, uh, again, as a community of refugees after the war. And the book is not only beautiful uh, articulation of the stories of his life, his travels, and his family, but also has amazing recipes, but more so the imagery in there is just spectacular. So I see a lot of you flipping through it. So please make sure to, to find your favorite recipe and have him sign that. Each recipe in the cookbook is detailed by the story of its inspiration and creation. And then today, Chef will demonstrate two recipes, the duck lop and uh, Da's blistered green beans, which I had at the restaurant when I was there. Um, as I mentioned, if you want to try the vegetarian options, which it sounds like that's a no, those are available. Um, I do want to uh, thank Paul Rivera. Raise your hand, Paul. Uh, Paul's one of our Googlers out of San Francisco who had reached out to the food team and said, you need to get him back here. When was your last talk? You did one a while back. I think right before we opened Hawker Fair San Francisco. Okay. I think 2015. Huh? All right. So every three years, we need to just bring him back here again. <laughs> so it's a huge pleasure to be able to uh, welcome Chef James. So please give him a round of applause and let him do his thing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for whoever traveled here. Uh, I know the traffic, sometimes five miles would be a long five miles. <laughs> down to 101. Um, so how many of you have read the book already? Yeah? So um, there might be some reiteration, so I apologize of like the story, how the book came about. Um, but the format of this demo, I want to be like a conversational piece. So please interrupt me. It doesn't have to be questions. It doesn't have to be directly about the dish I'm cooking. It could be general. It could be about culture. It could be about ingredients. It could be about anything in general. You know, one of our favorite hobbies. Mm, yeah. So um, we're going to demo two um, dishes. Uh, one is the first one we do is the da green beans. Um, that dish, my mom, my mother's name is Mani Da, Da for short. And this dish is kind of a tribute to her. Um, it's a traditional Thai dish. Is that we actually had this recipe at the restaurant, but it kind of morphed to a home cooked meal. Um, Usually it's called Pat Peking. It's usually with candied pork, uh, green beans, uh, homemade chili paste, oyster sauce, sugar. Um, that's very, very simple. Um, the question you might ask is like, how did we get, how did we get to bacon? So the story about the bacon part, which I'm gonna start get going. Um, growing up in Oakland, we came, uh, we were on um, welfare. So food stamps is how we uh, survive and how we uh, fed ourselves. And with food stamps, you were limited to what you can buy at the grocery stores. And that's when I was introduced to Oscar Mayer bacon. 
<laughs> and instead of candy pork, um, bacon was the substitute. You know. Is that on? Fans, thank you. Um, so that's how bacon was a substitute for that. So just like a lot of the recipes in the book, it's not meant to be authentic. It's kind of a, a filtration of traditional dishes that got adapted to our living situation in Oakland back in, from when we were growing up. These are just uh, blue lake green beans. Just pick off the stem end and it's going to deep fry ahead of time. And you can leave this at room temp. The oil is about 375 degrees. It's very, really, very really quick fry. Um, just enough for the skin to blister and crinkle up, but still has a remains of a nice good crunch and texture. Let's throw the rest of them in here. It's fairly quick easy recipe. But at the restaurants we served that we didn't we didn't use bacon. <laughs> we were uh, just like sliced pork that's been cooked down with uh, sugar and water until the water and the juices of the pork completely dry and then sugar caramelizes and it caramelizes itself. But at home you know time was an issue so my mother didn't know what bacon was, and she knew it was a pork product and it was pork belly, and she grabbed uh, a package of Oscar Mayer bacon and started making this at home. And it was actually the very first time I actually had this dish, it was with bacon, so I didn't know better. I didn't know what, where she was coming from. I never had the traditional way until we opened our restaurants. Um, that's good enough. I'm going to get all of it out. So we just push this to the back. So the beans can sit and chill out for a little bit. I like this. This is cool. Uh, You're going to ask me to do this. I haven't done this in months over here. You keep talking and we'll get okay. this thing rolling. Cool. So we've got, um, I'm not sure this is uh, Oscar Mayer, but you know, does, it, does it have to be? Uh, it's just a, it's just a funny, funny thing. Get that one on high. But you know, the, um, Thank you. in the book, you know, when we wrote the book, I think we had like a, had like 120 recipes, and we only had room for about 90, so I had to do a lot of edits. And to me, it's like which which recipe counts to include in the book? Which recipe tells a story? Uh, which recipe sets a tone and mood? and also unique, not to be innovative in any way, just more like make the story cohesive of what I wanted to write, like my memoir, like growing up. So this is a direct reflection of a dish, of, you know, of a sense of place and time in my life. Uh, bacon gets rendered a little bit of the fat. Use a spoon. Dishes. So I, if you were to do this with bacon, I uh, suggest buying a slab and cutting it thicker in batons like we do at the restaurant. You get more of a better bite. And that's the only change I made to my mom's original recipe. You know? um, let's fat render it a little bit. It doesn't have to be super crispy. The restaurant ingredients are really, really simple. We have oyster sauce. It's like a Thai brand, um, homemade curry paste. Um, making curry paste, you can make a lot of it. It lasts, it's pretty much bomb proof, you know. <laughs> Between the shrimp paste, all the dry ingredients, the uh, capsaicin, it's a, it's a preservative. Um, like if you have this in your pantry, I mean, you can pretty much make a lot of the recipes in the book really easily. Like the kapun, the noodle, the khao soy also have the same paste. So this is very, very versatile, you know. So you really have to muster your way into just making this with this dish, just make a lot of it. It just saves you so much more time. Bacon's there, I don't want it to completely crisp, a little caramelization is fine. Um, 
just want to add the curry paste. Kind of fry the curry paste to get it fragrant into the bacon fat. So I'll use the back of the spoon to kind of make it evenly. So we get like just some spice. Turn on the heat a little bit. Then we're gonna add the green beans. Just go off the heat. And pretty much everything's cooked at this point. You can kind of go off the heat. Um, oyster sauce. Um, sugar. Yeah, like you go to Ranch 99, you'll find everything. Yeah. So except for some of the, some of the specialty Thai brand sauces, you might have to try a little bit more searching. You know, um, I think Chef found a lot. Of, went to had a trip to took a trip to Oakland, right, to some Lao markets and Thai markets to find a couple of ingredients. Yeah, a little hunting. But, you know, like oyster sauce, um, like brands are very important. Some has higher salinity, some are sweeter. Uh, same thing with fish sauce. Like in the book, um, there's a photo, like a landscape photo of all the bottled sauces and stuff you would use. Um, so, you know, the best way I did that just because sometimes they, you, your mind spins when you go to the Asian market, you know, you're staring <laughs> at the soy sauce shelf for like, for like an hour, I'm like, which one am I getting? So I made that picture. So pretty much you just walk to a store with that photo and, you know, just know the labels. This is um, Makrut lime leaves, or kefir lime leaves, a little bit of chiffonade. And then, you know, we don't waste anything in our household. You know, even a little, little end bits. Unlike Komi, where we waste everything. <laughs> like the perfect leaf. You know, use 10% of it, throw away the rest. Chef, uh, the rest goes to staff meal. It's other than the trail. bacon, sorry, other than the bacon, which is not, you say, t typically traditional for, for this dish, this dish is pretty common in general. Are yeah. there other aspects of this dish that you do differently from a traditional a bean dish like this? Um, I've done it with, actually, there's a version of it with the catfish. Catfish. Actually, yeah, where you you would uh, roast the catfish whole, pick the meat out, uh, let it dry a little bit, and you fry it. Oh wow! And you just crumble it on top, man. Yeah, so there's like a pescatarian version of, of the dish as well. And there's also a condiment that you make uh, with catfish with the same curry paste, sugar. So you That's take the great. same catfish and it's caramelized, and you eat catfish in the same sauce. And it's almost like a, like a Thai version of furikake. Mm. So I would come home sometimes, you know, a warm pot of rice has been cooking. I just, just sprinkle that on top, fry an egg on it, and I have a meal, you know. So. What does your mom think of your rendition of the dish? Um, <laughs> you know, she, she, th she thought it was funny. <laughs> she thought it was interesting. It's just like, she's like, you know, she doesn't remember much, obviously. She's like, I use bacon? I'm like, yeah. That's, yeah, I remember Oscar Mayer went to Safeway, you know, remember the grocery outlet. We, we, got, we got a package of Oscar Mayer bacon. Um, yeah, it's, just, it's so funny, it's just like, and she didn't, you know, she, 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 she knocked my curry paste though. She's like, it's not spicy enough. I'm like, you know, I wanted more friggin' than spicy. And I'm like, you know, I kind of threw it back at her. It's like, did grandma, like, was grandma's uh, chili uh, curry paste different from yours? She's like, yeah. I was like, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's like everyone kind of adapts to their own flavor. Uh, which brings me to talk about the book and the recipes. The recipes are, you know, it's a baseline guide. You know, feel free to adapt, you know, your spice level, sweetness level. Um, don't search for authenticity because it is a unicorn. It doesn't exist, you know. A unicorn for me has three horns. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went like, you know, perfect example, I went to Thailand for a month on the first trip with my, with John Birdsaw, my co-author, and Eric Wolfbringer. We had some tham, or tham som, um, papaya salad, like maybe twice a day for 30 days. <laughs> and my argument just to prove it was like, how can you argue like, 
auntie's papaya salad is, is more authentic than the other person's. You can't. It's just, you know, it's, it's situational. People come from different backgrounds. People have different tastes and different palates and different likes. Um, I did that just, just, you know, not just to, you know, argue the term authenticity, but I am at the same time, but what's authentic is the nuances and the foundation of the dish. You know, every papaya salad, depending on where you're from, always has some sort of fish sauce. Either it's clarified or it's padat, depending if you're from the north or if you're from the south or if you're from central Thailand. You know, there's always papaya, there's always tomatoes. Central Thai, people like to not have padat because they're used to something more sweeter and have peanuts and dried shrimp. Where in the north we use, you know, padak, like fermented whole fish, sometimes salted river crabs, and it's not spicier and there's no sugar in it at all. So it's more and more savory. So it's like, okay, which one's authentic? It's like, uh, they're all authentic, you know, in their own very unique way. So when you like make these recipes, I say, you know, maybe make it to, it gets easier as you make it. You know, make the first one maybe exactly dead on to the recipes. I didn't eat it, you know. It's just like, what do I like about it? You know, what can, what, what? How can I make it to my liking? Even though I like a certain thing about it, you know. I kind of like adjust as you go. Um, making the recipes are hard because um, when I was writing the book and doing the recipes for the first time, a lot of it it was all due taste memories, and that's kind of how my like fine dining culinary skills came into play. I could analyze flavors. I know techniques, but I got into trouble where I was kind of overthinking it. You know, my mom had to help. I was like, you're overthinking it. Just throw it in. <laughs> and that's the beauty about this food. It's very, very instinctual. You know, I'm, I'm there on my gram scale, tarring <laughs> everything, managing everything. She's like looking at me, shaking her head. Yep. Like, you're just wasting your time, you know? And, and she's right, you know, the times that she made this dish or other dishes, like maybe a hundred times, they all taste different. There's no measurement. Sometimes it has, she omits ingredients, she replaces ingredients, but the nuances are there. And they're all just as satisfying, you know, like, and I don't remember the different versions, but I just know like that nuance is there. And that's why I remember the most. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I cook from. And the rest is kind of like to my personal taste, you know. But she had this issue, like, you put too much bacon in it. And I'm like, I love bacon. <laughs> it's like, you know, what's wrong with more bacon? It's like, you, more bacon, more better. You mentioned this is a simple dish, and I don't want to downplay the fact that I just counted the ingredients. It's almost like 15 or 16 different ingredients. Yeah. And the reason I mention that is um, we, trying to make vegetables delicious and craveable is not always easy. And I come from a background of Italy and English, as far as my parents go. And my mom would cook beans, typically just boiled beans. And so you have something to compare to that to this, which is just screaming with flavor and aroma. You guys are in for a treat. So yeah. really, really cool. Cool. Yeah, and then this, yeah, the hard part of this dish is the, the curry paste, really, you know. Um, if you have a shrimp allergy, just omit the shrimp paste. You'll be fine. You won't, you won't miss it. Uh, I substituted um, oyster sauce for like a Thai light soy sauce or seasoning sauce. You won't get the viscosity. You won't coat the beans as good. But, you know, you still have like that same umami flavor. Kalonga, it's a rhizome. zone. It's almost like ginger. Um, the direct, you cannot use it as ginger as a substitution. A lot of people make that mistake. It's, uh, it's totally, totally different. It uh, has more of a, um, it's like a sharp, like almost like citrus notes to it. Um, it's more fibrous, so you gotta really, really chop it to digest it. It's mostly used to um, steep in things like, like uh, soups and curries and whatnot, yeah. But you, it's edible, but you have to slice it very thin or pound it into the chili paste, yeah. If we're in a bind and we just want to buy a chili paste, would you or a curry paste, others, which one do you recommend? Which one I recommend? I recommend um, this brand called um, Ma Anong. M-A-E, second word, A-N-O-N-G. It comes in a, uh, a pouch, not in a tub. Yeah. And then she makes different curry, uh, curry paste. That's what my mom used like at the restaurants. Because like, it's so, because making the curry is so labor intensive and you know it's not as cost effective when you're selling you know back then my mom opened a restaurant in 88 in Concord I mean that with 
a side of rice was four dollars. You know, so making your own curry paste was not like <laughs> in the books with like three people in the kitchen doing 200 covers with a menu that is like lunch menu is like 26 items. Wow. Yeah, it's like a true mom and pop restaurant. Any other questions? Ma no M A E second word A N O N G. I might I might have spelled it wrong, but it's if you go to like any Thai market, you'll see like different curry paste. Some comes in a tub, but it comes in the a pouch. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Yep. So she makes a basic red, and also she makes a Peking version that has has like pretty much more um, macru um, kefir lime leaves in it. Yeah. But I prefer just to get the red as your base base ground and then add like fresh kefir limes in it. Yeah. Chef, Best part is make your own. <laughs> can we pass a little slice of the uh, galang all around so of people course. can see yeah. that? Thank you. It's like a different aromas. So next dish, uh, any other questions on the green bean dish? Um, I'm gonna make sure. I'm gonna make sure the recipe works. Is this one of your more popular sellers at the restaurant? Yeah, we sell a lot of green beans. Like, <laughs> jokingly, always joke with my GM. It's like we can just be like a five-dish restaurant. We'll be fine. <laughs> it's like this: fried chicken, um, mikati, and kai uh, ping because the uh, barbecue chicken and sticky rice and like the rest is just I think I like, ate all those when I was there. The rest <laughs> is kind of like filler. <laughs> and come on guy. Yeah. Really nice. Nice job. Uh, next dish, we're going to make lop. You might see on like Thai menus with different spellings. Some people call it spelled larb, some with a P, some people it's spelled with a B. I don't, I don't know the direct, correct way. You know, I think they're all correct. Um, depending where you're from, your pronunciation of the dish is different. Lab is a genre of uh, salads, like protein salads, pretty much. And when I say salad, it's not meant to be like a Caesar salad where you eat by itself. <laughs> I think people get it wrong when you, people say salad. In the Western culture, we think it's our first course and that's what we eat before our next thing. Um, Lao and Thai food, everything comes to the table at the same time or as it comes. And everything kind of, you eat with everything with each other. There's counterparts to it. You, it's a constructed meal rather than sequential. So growing up, um, lab was also a very like masculine thing. Uh, all the, when we have dinner parties or birthday parties in our backyard, it's the men who makes the lab, not the women. I think it goes back to in the villages, you know, the, the men were herders and, you know, took care of the livestock, so they did all the butchery, and it's nose to tail cooking, you know, nothing gets wasted. Um, but I chose duck, only because I remember as a, as, a, as a child, we used to get live ducks from, in farms in Merced, whenever we do the, parents do the slaughter. I remember plucking feathers for them. Um, I remember holding the duck while my, duck, while my father, you know, Slit the duck's neck and let it, and made like different variations of lob. One was like a raw one with like blood coagulated over the meat. It was like a panna cotta, which is called a lop lut, um, which didn't make it to the book <laughs> uh, for many reasons. One, because no one's going to make it, and also <laughs> I didn't want uh, I didn't want the uh, animal rights people knocking on my door. Um, but we, yeah, but that's that's going to be the B sides of the book. Um, but however, I, I got a whole duck. Um, gonna butcher this guy. Put on some gloves. You can use um, just duck breasts or duck legs. If you need to use like buy parts, you don't have to buy a whole duck to use the recipe. I would I champion the legs more than the breasts. Um, the connective tissue is delicious. Um, it's a darker, richer flavor. It, it's something that more resembles of like say a wild duck. Um, that's what I'm going for. So 
I'll take this apart. Um, I'm just going to use, let's make a small portion, but today I'm just going to mix the two. That, just the breast. Oh, and the offal, we'll put some offal in it too. So like I said, nothing goes to waste. Um, having lob to be gamey, it's like, it's like a good thing. Thai and Lao, okay. In um, the same, same, but different. That's the kind of term <laughs> they use a lot when it comes to in like in Lao, like in Thailand. So a lot of the, it goes back to politics, history uh, of politics. Um, the northeastern part of Thailand, where I'm from, um, which is about a third of Thailand now, uh, it used to be part of the Lao Kingdom uh, when Thailand was called Siam. The French came in, colonized Laos, which was also part of Thailand, like the Isan area, that's part of Laos. And then, you know, I don't know what happened, but that, that part of land was not fertile. You know, it was landlocked, it was dry, it was humid. You can't do anything with that land. It was kind of like, but it was like the French traded, gave it to Thailand for, I don't know what, but maybe some kind of political deal they had. It's like, hey, we'll give you this part of land, you know? And borders got redrawn, and now part of the Isan, that part of Laos is now part of Thailand. So when people ask me, like, oh, that's why I'm going to specifically say where I'm from, or it's like, oh, I'm Thai Isan, which means I'm nationally Thai, but I'm culturally Lao. Does that make any sense? Um, it's like saying you're Basque. You know, it's like, are you Spanish or are you French Basque? Um, so a lot of the food, as we know, is um, Thai, like you see in restaurants, and Thai restaurants, and rightfully so, like Lob, um, a lot of it originated from Laos, you know, because from Isan, which is now Thailand, so you can actually call it Thai. Um, and during like Industrial Revolution in Bangkok, a lot of the uh, blue collar workers, your taxi drivers and construction workers, they're all Lao. So they go to the city, you know, to roll the dice on, on the dream and making a living in the big city. And they brought their food with them, you know, because it was more delicious than central Thai food. It was spicier, it was different. So they start cooking for themselves. And then the public, the existing public in central Thailand started to take notice. What is this food? You know, it's so different from ours. It's delicious. It's very, very spicy. It's funky. It's higher in salt. And then, you know, the butlers and the maids were making this dish for, for, their, for their bosses, and they started to like it. And then that's how the Lao culture, you know, infused into Thai culture, and a lot of dishes now are, became Thai, per se, which is still correct. You know, it's just like the origin, chasing back dishes was like very, very interesting to me. You know, like you know, food travel with people. So I'm just gonna rough chop this breast. I'm gonna do a mixture of both. I'm making a small portion, so like save the skin, the fat. That's like the most prized part. That's where we make the cracklings to go on top of the lop. Bones we save. Nah, just just you? just like I said, I think the the best part of making of lob, lob the dish itself is actually making it. Oh. Yeah, that's like that's the most satisfying part for me. You know, it's just this, uh, it's very very rustic. It's very primitive. You know. Um, so that's the meat. Shake off the meat as much as you can for the skin. We're going to render the skin. 
the skin we're going to slice really, really thin. And we're going to start rendering into its own fat and we'll chop the meat for the lob. Um, to make some cracklings or chicharrones, that's what they call it these days. Yeah, it's like, don't worry about having like perfect cuts, you know. And the best part of this food and this dish is my mom did all this thing on like a $2 tin knife that you get at the, at the grocery store. I still have one actually, and that was funny enough, funny story when I was doing the cookbook shoot and we shot the whole, all the recipes at Hawker Fair, Oakland. Uh, we were close for lunch at that time, so we did. So it's probably to say this book was made in Oakland, like, you know, from um, the recipes to the photos. But I went out and bought like, like the, the brand's called Kiwi. It's like a wooden handle, it comes in different shapes. You know, I actually bought like a couple of those knives to do the recipe, and just just kind of puts me in the mood. You know, it's just like. It's like, okay, I don't need like a $200 like Masamoto knife to cook this dish. It's kind of ridiculous, kind of overkill, you know. It just goes to show that, you know, like a simple, I'm going to chop this first. So this, usually you get a cleaver or a heavy chef's knife. And you just go, you just go at it, actually. So my mom would do was she will like chop the livers into it give like more irony flavor to it yeah you know, so i remember coming coming home after school you just hear that noise i was like i know what we're having for dinner <laughs> i know and you smell sticky rice steaming in the background, you know. I was like, oh, dad must request a lot, but he doesn't have time to do it for himself, so <laughs> mom has to do it. Uh, if you like duck, it's, it could be done with chicken as well. It works just as well. And I would just use, like, you know, thigh meat. The, the breast meat becomes too, like, stringy and, like, mealy, you know. It doesn't have, like, a nice succulents. And sometimes we'll slice offal into it, like the gizzards into it as well. I mean, why not? I got it. I have it. So. All right. All right, we're going to start cooking. So we're going to render the skin first. I got, I got this down. Ah. Got it all figured out now. <laughs> so I like to start from like a cold, cold pan. Just a duck. And we're gonna cook this down um, until it gets like crispy. Should be fairly quick, actually. Um, Yeah, like go back to like lobs and salad lob as a salad. It's always eaten with like sticky rice or with a, you know, lettuce, um, in this case cabbage, kind of depends on what it is. So we're going to bring this to fat. And of course, beer. <laughs> and weirdly enough, people ask me like the last thing I did, it's like, what's the best pairing you eat with lob and like your food and like in the book? And I was being honest, and everyone laughed, but it was a joke. I was like, Heineken. <laughs> so for some reason why, like, even to this day, in the cookbook, there's like some pictures of a backyard party. It's like Heineken is always there. I, I think it's more, I think when we came to America, we view it as like a exotic beer. <laughs> I don't know, it's like the green bottle. They don't drink Singha, they don't drink beer Lao. Just so used to that, you know, at home. So it's like Heineken, which makes sense, like really refreshing. And like, you know, it's a sessional beer, you know, it's like, I think like five of them. But yeah, Heineken is like the best pairing. Yeah, I try other craft beers with it, you know, like lighter session beers, and lagers. I'm like, eh, it's not the same. <laughs> I don't know, I, I, I think it's just more of like a mindset for me. 
Yeah, and people are like, you drink Heineken? I'm like, yeah, situational. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I find your cuisine, uh, this cuisine, to be probably the most interesting. It's one of my personal favorites. I haven't been to Laos. I've had, uh, obviously, a lot of Thai food. But, you know, the interesting complexities of, of uh, different ingredients, umami, textural, color. Are there other cuisines that you would recommend that are similar to this, other than Thai and Laos, Burmese, um, maybe? That have that Burmese, same, yeah. yeah, that same kind of complexity that just keeps it so exciting. Uh, I love Malaysian, uh, Indonesian food. Yeah, you know, they do more curries, yeah, because mm -hmm. of the Muslim population. But I think it's just as interesting to do a lot of fermentation, fermentation to um, spice levels, yeah. uh, whatnot. Um, yeah, Indonesian food, uh, Burmese, like you mentioned, um, as well. Vietnamese food seems to be a little bit on the lighter side of things. It mm -hmm. has, definitely has a, a French influence to it, like Bami's, you know, French baguettes, and so on and so forth. How's the smell back there? We're torturing everyone behind this wall. <laughs> They're like, hey, that's not on the menu today. So I'm going to reserve this duck fat, but I'm going to take the cracklings off of it. Oh, interesting story. I always love cooking. So I spent my summers, we didn't, you know, parents couldn't afford to send me to camp. So my camp was restaurant camp. My first job was at the restaurant. I was 10 years old, washing pots and pans, walks, you know, like the mop sink, because I wasn't tall enough. I was making five bucks a week. I was like, I felt like I was rich. <laughs> You know, it was like, hey, I go hey, run the 7-Eleven, get all the candy I want. <laughs> um, but, you know, I come home late night, turn on the TV, start watching uh, Chefs of the World. I can't remember what the PBS program is. And I just saw, like, you know, Claude Toigo and these white toques, you know, copper everywhere, you know, their Bonnet stove. I was like, there's an elegant side of cooking that's beyond like my mother's cooking, you know, and which is kind of like makeshift, right? And I love food, and my mom is doing all she can to prevent me to like cook, you know, like like oh this is such a hard life, so much sacrifice. Said, yeah, but I enjoy it, and I had to convince her. I'm like, look, there's an upside to this, <laughs> you know, like chefs are highly regarded. Um, so I went into culinary school. I knew what I wanted to do when I was like, you know, at 10 or 11, I wanted to be a chef. Um, but in like the higher echelon level of cookery and hall cuisine. So, you know, I obsessively went to magazine racks, um, downtown Oakland, looking through like gourmet and Bon Appetit at that time. Art Culinaire was a big one that blew my mind. Um, and high school, um, you know, they, they all these like career talks and stuff like that. And I got into like AP class. I'm not supposed to tell these stories to my kids ever. My <laughs> wife banned me. She's like, I knew what I wanted to do. And now I got into like a Padilla program, which is like, you know, college prep class. And I'm like, I want to be a chef. Like, I don't need to read Scarlet Letter, <laughs> you know? I was like, I don't need to remember these big words, you know? I did it for a year and I told my counselor, I was like, I need to drop out of AP. I mean, I can do the work. I just, I don't see it benefiting me. So I dropped out all my EP classes, took only what I needed to graduate. And I started uh, roaming around Oakland, the kitchens at that time it was Oliveto. Uh, that was nearby the campus. And so I tried to get in there and I was like, what, 15 then? And I was like, no way, I'm gonna have a little minor. You know, I was like, I'll wash dishes and do whatever I want. Um, but it, didn't, it wasn't until like culinary school um, I got, you know, into like exposed to like, you know, brown butter, creme fraiche, <laughs> you know, we, we never used dairy, you know, in our cooking. It was like coconut milk was the closest thing. <laughs> and, yeah, and then like, you know, from there on, it was like, I was just kind of hungry for more. And interesting enough, my first job at culinary school wasn't at a fine dining or European restaurant. It was actually at a Pan-Asian place uh, called Beetle Nut. Uh, not Beetle Nut, it was called Xanadu. It was in Berkeley on 4th Street uh, with Alex Ong. And then from then on, you know, I did that. 
start paying back tuition and you know, I still want to pursue this. And then uh, someone told me about Manresa and uh, kind of the rest is kind of history after that. Right? Just, you can't skip over these big restaurants. What are some of the ways that Manresa or Fat Duck have kind of sculpted you to who, how you are? And I'm sure there's yeah. memorable episodes in those yeah, kitchens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Manresa was like, you know, it was like walking into here. It was like Starship Enterprise. <laughs> you know, shiny, it was, it was things I saw on TV. You know, everyone's in like nice, pristine chef whites. Everyone's like, you know, order comes in. Everyone's simultaneously saying, yes, chef. Everything is in unison. You know, I was like, whoa, it was like, I never cooked on a French top before. You know, I burned a lot of things on it. Uh, my first go. Um, and, you know, it's just the discipline. That's the main thing I went there for. It's like the discipline of like, you know, like I need to make myself kind of OCD to do this. You know, I was kind of OCD anyways, but like the precision, um, I think respect for the craft, also exposure to different ingredients, and also like the mind frame of like creativity and how that works. But also keep in mind like, you know, like flavor is paramount. At the end of the day, our job is to make food delicious. Uh, but also we also like the artistry of it. You know, it's, it's a performance, it's a big production, not just even after the food leaves the kitchen pass, you know, how it's served, how does, you know, what utensils are used, how the servers explain your dish. You know, like I really got into and educated myself on that, on that standpoint um, through Manresa. And then, you know, obviously Manresa was inspired by European restaurants because David Kinch, because he worked in Europe. And like, El Bui, what the hell is this place? You know, I was like, are they on Mars or they're on Earth? You know, and I need to go see it for myself. You know, I was getting a filter of it through him. And this is my first time leaving home. You know, I've been living, living home for my last, all my life, even after culinary school and working. So I was like, yeah, if I'm gonna go away, I'm gonna go away pretty far. <laughs> so when Mugaritz, Fat Duck, my three month trip became a year. Uh, and came back and just kind of a whole new sense of eating and an approach to cooking in general, you know, and just to see how the rest of the world eats um, culturally. You know, I was like having dinner at 9 p.m. That's new to me, like in Spain, you know, it's, it's just, uh, just understanding, like having a global view kind of really helped me shape like my cuisine and also understand like food as like it's an international language you know you know, things taste good or they don't no matter what it is I think you should just go there and try it you know a lot went to the Basque country I landed I didn't know what half of the things I was eating actually 90 percent of things like cocochas I'm like well, I'll try it you know that's what I'm here for is to learn you know it's trial and error it's a, it's a classic traditional dish I mean, if it's a classic dish, it means it must taste really, really good. You know, it stayed test of time. Um, yeah, that's how I, I kind of got into it. But then I eventually circled back to Hawker Fair because it's like, I want to say Kumi is like what I love to do. But like the Hawker Fair is kind of who I am. It's kind of like, kind of bridging the gap. Um, Did Disney blend you ever? Did Disney blend like that kind of food coming from this kind of food? Um, it didn't taste bland because it, it was more, it's like soothing. It was more herbaceous. Um, the flavor delivery was different. You know, here it's more of the back, you know, it's spice and salt. So it's the side of your tongue, it's the tip and the back. Where your pink cooking, it's more fats. So I think it's like coats the palate and more. It's, um, texture I was used to, you know, chewing on gristle and tripe and things like that. Not a thing, but like, having uh, like a really silk like puree or something you know that, that was like that was new to me you know the closest thing we have was tofu <laughs> right you know, we didn't have you know blancmange or panna cottas or pom puree you know and that's that's like okay i can understand why this is elegant you know and richness you know i think asian food is richness in flavor but european food is just rich rich like you know it's like indulgent right yeah when people like say like asian food like maybe japanese food but people don't say it's indulgent it's like people always say it's very flavorful and really it's rare you see like asian food is rich um i think we're uh, i want to feed you guys so i think we start handing out food actually what do you think
What's up, Chef? <laughs> Dude, you're late, man. <laughs> um, so to make this lob, it's uh, pretty much a one-pot dish. I keep everything in the pan. Gonna some chilies. I like to use some mortar and pestle. Um, you can use a coffee grinder, but be careful not to pull too much where it gets obliviated. But I like having like bits of skin, some bits of seeds in there as well. I like to toast the chilies in like a dry pan or on the flame. If you have the luxury to do the show in the barbecue, get thick skin, like dry chilies get really croquant and like really crisp and makes it easier to break down. This here. I'm gonna move this over here. And then we're gonna start seasoning away. Um, everything's all measured out for me. I'm cheating. Um, toasted rice powder goes in, just sticky rice, um, the stuff you eat with your hands, just dry, toast in a dry pan to the color of like, like roasted coffee. Um, each province in Thailand have different color that they recommend, but we always, in Laos, it's always like very, very dark. We want to get like that toastiness um, color. This is ground a little bit too fine. It should be, in, if you're done in a mortar and pestle, it's kind of like little bits of rice. Yeah, it's like a smokiness to the dish. Yeah. It also uses like a binding agent as well, and it's almost like an emulsifier, but it's also for like texture as well. Um, for fish sauce, this is like the, I want to say extra version of fish sauce, it's fish sauce, and then you have padak or para, which is also a fish sauce. So we have, when you're doing the fish sauce process, you know, all the sediment falls to the bottom, the clear stuff floats to the top, you decanter it, you get the clear stuff, more refined, like like say first press, and then you have like the deliciousness <laughs> of padak, which is you know a lot of uh, city like Thai people really don't like. It's really really strong, but that separates us from the north and south. It's also you know it's high salt, so it's like as a like preservative. Mm. So dump that all in. Um, I'm gonna slice some lemongrass. Lemongrass, I like to slice from the root end, and you kind of slice it slightly on a bias. It actually makes it more tender. It's easy, it makes it easier to slice because the fibers you're cutting against the grain. Paper thin. So on this recipe, there isn't any citrus at all or lime juice. Um, the citrus comes from the lemongrass, not not as much for flavor, but more so for the aromatics and you have to slice this fairly paper thin to make it digestible it can come like pretty unpleasant to eat okay that's plenty put that in there um shallots Slice to the side rather than half moons. And lob is it's, it's um, technically served room temp. It never should be warm. You can serve it warm, but you know if it's left out to room temp, that's perfectly okay too. Okay. The shallots in there. Um, we're going to add fresh Thai chilies to this batch. I like it, uh, I like putting Thai chilies in there because they're, they're like little minefields, <laughs> you know, like, as, you, as you chew. Get, get somebody off guard, you know, and it becomes lots of fun. That's when the, that's when the Heineken comes out. Um, we can do scallions. The scallions, I like to use the white and the green, so have a little mixture of both. Um, the scallions too, like I learned, I was making a mistake making these recipes, I was cutting things too fine. So I'm so used to 
No, the other thing about fine dining is I became a jarhead of refinement, which kind of works against me when I was making these dishes. You know, I was over overthinking it. You know, things were in too things were too fine. It just gets lost. Mm -hmm. You know, things were cut certain ways with intention, um, so it'd be very distinct. All right, that goes in. Then we have cilantro, cilantro mint. Cilantro, I like to use all of it, the stems and stuff like that. That's the one thing, every time my mom comes to Kumi, first thing she walks up to is look at the compost bin. <laughs> and she always is like, oh, somebody misplaced this? I'm like, no mom, we only want the flowers. It's like we already have cilantro. Like the guys been eating cilantro salad for the last like two weeks, <laughs> and and she just like shakes her head and she goes, "How do you guys make? How do you mean make any money here?" I'm like, "We don't. It's an art project." <laughs> yeah, and a little mint, I'm torn. Like I said, it's kind of a rustic dish, so um, yeah, you don't have to chop your mint or cilantro fine. You know, you use everything you can. Kind of piece it together. Is that true that Kumi doesn't make anything? Most restaurants are hard, they're difficult. Margins are so slim. Like Kumi, huh? I would have thought that with all the recognition. I mean, it's sustainable. You know, I'm not going to be driving Tesla anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, then it just makes it like you would like a salad. You know? The more herbs, the better. Yeah, supposed to be spicy and aromatic. Let's go from this guy. Oh, I should taste this, huh? Oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Always eaten with like a wedge of cabbage. The cabbage is kind of like you break off petals of it and you either eat the lot first with a ball of sticky rice. How many have, uh, people had sticky rice before? No? Cool. You know how to eat sticky rice with your hands, right? You like always tell people it's pretend it's a tor uh, tortilla. It's the easiest way to explain it. Like the sticky rice is your utensil. Little slices of cucumber, the garnish inside. It's a pretty veg forward dish if you consider it. There's a lot of yeah, lot going on there. I actually made this with tofu before for a for a it's delicious. For a guest. What do you guys think? Thai chilies for the Thai chilies huh? for the brave. And that's that's all of it, yeah. Thank you. Nice Thank job. You. Nice job. Sorry, I didn't mean to make a mess. <laughs> cool. How's the food tasting? It's delicious. Thank you for the team back there to produce the, uh, the food for you guys are eating. Yeah. 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 Really Thank you, job. team. So, um, Huge thanks to not only uh, everyone in the back that prepared the team, but also to Laura and the team that set this up. Uh, getting these food talks going uh, looks easy here, but it's a massive amount of work to pull chefs out of their restaurants to get these kitchens reserved and to have all of you show up so eagerly as you did. So thank you for coming and thank you to, to the team that planned it. Um, enjoy your, your snacks and then uh, Chef will be signing books right after that. And I know most of you have a day job to go back to, so we'll try to keep it uh, short and sweet. So again, huge round of applause for Chef James. Thank you very much. Nice job. Thank you.